and welcome to another Bible study, Saints of the Most High God. Let me take this opportunity to greet and to welcome all the saints of God, all our visiting friends, for being a part of Bible study another Wednesday evening. The Lord richly bless you. Thank you for tuning in for those who are already on. And for those who will be joining a little later, we certainly look forward to having you. We are in the book of Genesis, and the last week we had given a preamble. We had started, and we are going to be going through the book of Genesis, a very important book. It's important that we take the time out to understand what is happening at the very beginning, at the origin of things. And our understanding of the book of Genesis will allow us to put into perspective things that we will see happening later on in the Bible. When we get a good grasp of Genesis, we will appreciate later on when we see things about in Exodus about the sacrifices that had to be made in order to bring the people back into right relationship with God. When we go further down in time and we see the sacrifice that Jesus Christ himself made on the cross, we will have a perspective, a proper appreciation for why that was necessary and where it was coming from. And all of these things emerge right here in the book of Genesis. Most folks are unaware of the importance of looking on the Bible holistically. We might believe that Genesis is a book in the Old Testament and we are no longer in the Old Testament period. So that very little effort very, is given, very little time is made to drill down and to look into the books of the Old Testament. But I want us saints of God to understand that the Bible, though consisting of many books, together form one comprehensive book that expresses to us the mind and the plan of Almighty God. And what better way if we are moving to get a good understanding of the entire book than to start at the beginning, than to get to the point where it all happened, where it all started, where it all originated. And so the book of Genesis, as we said last week, is very, very important. It is vital to understanding the rest of the Bible. And so we are going to take some time and we are going to go through this very important book. Now, there are three main objectives that I would hope that we grasp as we go through the book. I might add at the very beginning that we are not going to go through the book of Genesis uh, verse by verse because while that can be done, it certainly will take us a very long time. The, the book has uh, just about 50 chapters and it spans a period of 2,300 and odd years. And so we, we are certainly not going to be going through verse by verse. But then there are so many different themes, so many different activities, so many different lessons that are spread throughout the book that if we take the main themes and then go into some other areas as we go through the broader themes, we will find that there are lessons to be learned. There are things that we can grasp that will certainly illuminate our minds and help us to be clear and to put into proper and correct perspective things which are there for us. And so it will be a journey. It is a book 
that once we start going through, we will love it. We will see that it has the, the beginning of practically everything. When we met last week, we did make mention that it spoke about the beginning of the universe, the beginning of life, the beginning of family life, the beginning of sin, the beginning of death. It had the first prophecy. It had the first sacrifice. Amen. It had uh, the art. It was the beginning of agriculture. It was the beginning of nations. It was the beginning of governments. Everything that we see in our society today, in our world today, had its beginnings right in the book of Genesis. And so it is my intention in going through that three main things we capture, we grasp, and three main objectives uh, are etched in our minds. One, I would love as we go through and coming out of the study of the book of Genesis, objective number one, that our faith in the word of God and in this book in particular, since we are on to Genesis, that our faith is builded. And especially as we go through the Genesis, it is important that that is an objective. Why? The book of Genesis is one of the most attacked book, if not the most attacked book in the Bible. If Satan can get us to the point where we distrust the narrative that is there, if he can get people to the point where they are wavering in their minds as to the authenticity of the book, and for the reason that the things that are there uh, are not scientifically proven, they are not there based on logics, they are just some things that are stated, it provides fodder for those who are scientific in their minds, for those who are atheistic in their approach to life, to taunt and to ridicule the book. And so this book, when we go through the universities, the colleges around the world, the professors present a totally different view of the origin of species, the origin of things as we know them. And they use science to the extent that it weakens the faith of so many and cause folks to put aside what the Genesis account of creation states as a biblical fact. And so this book of Genesis is constantly under threat, constantly under attack by the atheists, by certain scientists and certain groups, and we ought to be very careful. So that as we go through, we will see that there can be and ought to be confidence in what is written there because they are facts. And number one, in terms of objectives, that our faith is properly builded. Number two, we want when we come out of the book that we are able to address certain critical questions that naturally would arise from going through the book and also from what we would have learned in school and the things that we would have seen and, and things that would have been presented to us about how things could have come about. I want to take on some of the questions and present to us clear answers you know, as part of the objective so that we can see that indeed the things that are written in the book, that they are true, 
that they are trustworthy. We will link it with things as they are today so that we can look back to see that indeed the book had to be inspired. And third and finally, I would want coming out as one of our objectives in going through the book for us to establish the purpose. Why was Genesis written? The purpose of the book. Because it is important, saints of God, to understand that everything that we are seeing in our world today is as a result of some things that happened in the book. And if we are going to make sense out of what we are seeing in our world today, if we are going to make sense out of what we are presenting to humankind when we preach and teach this gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, it is important that we go back to the beginning and the book of Genesis is where that beginning is and then to establish the purpose of the book so that we can put things into uh, proper alignment and perspective and see clearly, amen, through these lenses. So three things, to build our faith, to answer some critical questions that naturally arise, and to give purpose for the book of Genesis. These should be clear to us when we come out of the book. So let us just review a few of the things that we had touched on last week, and then we continue on. As I said uh, last week, and reiterated just now, we will not go through on a verse-by-verse -verse basis because it will be too much and it will take so much time, but so much is there in the book that if we can do a nice overview, present to us a panorama of things that are presented in the book, we will have a good sense of what the book is about, what it establishes, where it is going, why things are as they are right now. There are, brothers and sisters, some questions that naturally would arise. Yes, where did God come from? Uh, and if God only made Adam and Eve, where is it that the races that we know today, how did they come about? If our parents were just two persons from one race, how is it that we have Chinese, we have Negroes, we have Caucasians, we have Indians, we have where did all these people come from? Why is it that we have Arabs, we have Jews, we have where and how did these things come about? Can I submit to us, saints of God, that the answers to these questions are in the book of Genesis? Folks ask the question, Adam and Eve, they got together and they had two children, Cain and Abel. And then Cain killed Abel. Yet, he was sent out from the garden. And when he left, he went and built cities and married to wives and had children. Where did Cain get his wife? And all of these are questions that are legitimate questions. They are questions that people ask. And because there seem to be no answer to these questions, folks tend to doubt the validity, the authenticity, the, the, the true inspiration of the book of Genesis. And it is a source of discontent in the lives of many, even who claim to be Christians, who claim to know God. So we're going to take time and systematically go through as we go through now, we will do a survey of the book, looking at chapter by chapter so to see the main theme coming from each chapter, coming from each period. And once we get that and get a good feel for the book, then we are going to zoom in on some particular thoughts, thoughts about creation. You know, there are folks, saints of the Most High God, that hold the view that this earth is old. They call it the old earth theory. And the estimates are that the earth is about 4.5 billion years old. 
they claim then that it is here that an explanation can be given to where and the period in which the dinosaurs and so forth existed and they go back using processes that that we call for example carbon dating to give the age of certain fossils that they have excavated in different places across the earth and based on the testing using the carbon dating methodology they have found that some of these animal bones date back to millions of millions of years ago so they are of the view that the earth could not the world as we know it could not have been created a couple thousand years ago as we purport from the book of genesis and so this uh view that seemed to be differ differing a different view from what we would have taught and what we would have known and what we would have learned and it seems uh pragmatic in terms of its presentation that it is right because if you're finding fossils of animals from millions of years and scientific technologies are here to prove the age of these fossils then it means that the earth have been around for a very long time and that is a source of confusion in the minds of many because we teach the new earth or the young earth uh, theory where based on scriptures the bible in the new testament gospels trace the generation back and it goes all the way back to Adam and they can take it from Adam's generation all the way down to the time of the Lord Jesus Christ. And at those generations, we will get clearly that this earth has been around going on about 6,000 years now. So that if based on the chronology and the genealogy given in the book, we find that the earth is about 6,000 years. And yet, scientific data that dates certain fossils that they have found dates back millions of years. How do we reconcile this? Who do we go with? You know, the proof is what can be presented. And so, it is a source of confusion. It is a source of great challenge to many christians but as i said we are going to take the time and we are going to delve as we go into the book of genesis as we go through certain aspects we are going to delve into some of these things and we are going to show that the bible has to be correct it is the word of god and it doesn't matter what science have shown i'm going to show us that some of these dating methodologies have proven to be wrong over and over and over again and the truth is the, the the word of the lord has never and can never be wrong so we are going to go through and we are going to drill in and we are going to deal with these questions and we are going to make genesis come alive so that we can understand what is there contained in the book so while we will be doing that we will also be extracting lessons to be learned and there are so many lessons but what we consider the 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 more prominent the more pronounced lessons we are going to extract them and we are going to present to us that the things that we experience today even as it relates to temptation the things that we see today even as it relates to sacrifices that have to be made as a part of our experience in serving God, had their origins in the book of Genesis. And there is so much to be learned. But let us take time now. We are going to go through and do a survey of the book. We did start last week, so we are going to quickly do a quick revision, pick up, and then continue in this survey so that we can have a good sense of what the book is about, a good sense of what uh, we are going to be contending with. And then we move from there. Once we are wrapped up with that survey, 
we move into some of the specific areas, answer some of the questions that have been there standing for long so that there is clarity, we appreciate the book, and then we can move on into the other books. And there is a, there, there is a good reason for us having done the book of Genesis probably to look at the book that follows and a few that follows so that we can see that the Bible is not a haphazard approach to providing information to us but everything is done sequentially and with a purpose and if we want to get properly the understanding of the overall book it might be good so we might brothers and sisters go on a journey getting an overview getting a survey of the books of the bible so that we can understand fully the entire bible we might take it with the old testament first and just take it from genesis right down to malachi never know where the lord would lead but it is important to get a grasp a good understanding of the books a survey a panoramic overview and then extract lessons and we will do that starting with the book of Genesis so let us turn to the slide and let us do a quick review and continue so that we are clear in terms of what the book of Genesis is all about God bless you so we did say that the name Genesis amen means beginning the word Genesis actually comes from the Greek uh, which means origin the Hebrew equivalent literally means beginning and so it is important that we understand that it is the beginning the origin of things as we know them now the book has 50 chapters and it gives us as we just said uh, the origin of all things right and we have presented a breakdown of the chapters so and and what are the main historical points that is contained in each of these chapters the book has 50 chapters and each of them has some critical point that they bring out to us and so we have put it together in a nice compact form and I've presented the theme that each chapter presents so that when we look at chapter one as we're seeing on our screen we are seeing that between verses 1 to 25 we are seeing uh, it shows us everything that has to do with the world that we now know the creation of all things it gives us uh, everything in terms of creation. Uh, it talks to us about what God did and what God did each day. He worked for six days. And then on the seventh day, you know, God rested. And it is important that we take the time out and, and, and understand all that Genesis 1 has to offer to us so it gives a description the theme of it is the world as we know it then genesis chapter 1 verses um 26 all the way over to chapter 2 uh verse 25 it speaks about humanity where god created man and then where from man god made woman and then the two coming together had their children cain and abel the the this chapter one and two gives us an outline and an overview of humanity as we know it then chapter three uh the first seven verses gives us and easily shows the entrance of sin into the world yes it it simply tells us about the serpent and how he came to eve and how he tested and tempted Eve 
and cause her to doubt the word of God. And so we are seeing that right here in chapter 3 in those first seven verses, the entrance of sin into the world. Then from about verse 8 down to verse 24, it speaks about, in terms of the theme, the promise of redemption. So although sin came into the world and death would have come as a result of sin, chapter 3 gives us, uh, uh, in terms of the theme of the remainder of the book, the promise of redemption. Now chapter 4 tells us about family life. This is where we see that Adam and Eve now started to reproduce and they had children and they taught their children, no doubt, because as we go further down, we realize that they had to teach them the things that they would have learned from God. And it speaks then of the origins of family life right there in Genesis. And between verses 1 to 15, we get a good synopsis of family life. Then, as we go from verse 16 all the way down to chapter 9 and to the end of chapter 9, we see in terms of the general theme, uh, man-made civilization. Yes, it started with Cain, who having slew, slain his brother, he was pushed out of the garden and he went and he started to build cities. And once that started, cities thereafter, yes, uh, started to be built in other places. And so Genesis chapter 4, 1 to 15 speaks to family life. But then from verses 16 all the way down to chapter 9 and verse 26, it speaks about man-made civilization. And this is how the books are, the chapters, sorry, are broken down so that we can extract the main themes of these books, of these chapters. Now, chapters 10 and 11 speaks to the nations of the world. It gives us a breakdown of how the different nations as we know them started to emerge and how they were spread across. And as we take our time and go through uh, in later studies in Genesis, we will see the origin of the Arabs. We will see the origin of other groups and get a good sense of where the different tribes, the different nations and their locations, we will see where they come from. And it is when we are at this point that we will take some time and look at where they all spent time, where they were located after a certain event, because it is from here that they started to exhibit certain traits consistent with the particular geographical location where they settled, that they started to become adapted to those conditions. And so you have folks started to take on certain kind of characteristics consistent with their geographical location and this would speak and we will talk about that later on this will speak to the origin of races and nations and so forth then we observe that the entire rest of the chapters from chapter 12 all the way down to chapter 50 it speaks about the Hebrew race, the Jews, a particular people that God ultimately um, held as his very own. And we will take our time and we will go through some of the things, yes, that we see in ch chapters 12 to 50 as we go through the book. It speaks about the patri patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac. Jacob and it closes um, with Joseph and so this is essentially the breakdown of the chapters of Genesis with the main themes that they present yes and it is important that we grasp this simple but very crucial bit of information now as we 
spend some time going through, we will realize that the only thing that was not presented as having a beginning is the fact of the existence or if i might say the beginning of god the only beginning not recorded in genesis is god it speaks nothing to where he comes from it speaks nothing about his origin it simply states in genesis chapter 1 and verse 1 in the beginning god created the heaven and the earth and it is important that nowhere does the book even try to prove the existence of god but we can observe as we go through we see a seamless tapestry of things happening that makes us clear in our minds that God had to be there. Things just came together. Things just happened in a certain format. Things just took a certain sequence of operation that it could not be by chance. So that, brothers and sisters, when we hear that we came here by a, a big bang, a mistake, two things collided, and there was a big bang, and out of nowhere, some ape-like creatures just existed, and over time, they evolved to become people that we are today with mental faculties intact and the ability to think and the ability to plan and it came from nowhere except by an accident brothers and sisters when we go through the pages we will see that it is absolutely untenable to hold such a view there had to be divine intelligence there had to be intelligence when we look at the flowers and the beauty of flowers and the petals on these flowers when we look at the the magnificence of the trees and the seasons that we know when we look at the fruit that comes from the the tree and everything comes around in its seasons in its season when we look at the timing when we look at the movement of the planets and then the entire galaxy as we know it and the order in which they operate when we look at everything in the cosmos and see how they flow how they pass how they don't collide and if there is collision it is to form something else that forms part of a larger chain of things happening when we look how the planets revolve and where earth is concerned it revolved 24 hours around its axis and it happens like this from the time that we were born till now and long before we were born it was happening when we look at the fact that earth is not being held up by anything but it is being held in space by itself it is impossible to leave with the view that this all came about due to some accident due to some collision of 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 things in the billions of years past and they eventually led to this intelligent organized systematic order in which we exist it is virtually impossible so without god having to step into time and give a background as to who he is he simply introduces himself by saying in the beginning god created the heavens and the earth and it is important that we understand and that we accept this as a fact yes now it is accepted by most christian scholars by theologians because there are few that questions uh if moses could actually have written the book of genesis but it is generally accepted that the author of the book is moses and this fact was confirmed by jesus in saint john chapter 5 verses 46 to 47 and in fact uh, some german bible translations even substitute the name genesis so in, instead of writing genesis they write first moses because they consider that this was the first book that moses wrote in the same way 
how in Revelation it talks about the revelation of St. John, which was, as we know, it was the revelation of Jesus Christ. But because John wrote the revelation, they call it the revelation of John, but it was really the revelation of Jesus Christ. It is a similar way that this book, Genesis, which we accept was written by Moses and corroborated by Jesus in St. John 5, the German Bible translators of all has the name as first Moses. So yes, indeed, in terms of the authorship of the book, it was written by Moses. Now, in terms of the, the wide scope of the book, from Genesis 1 all the way down to Genesis 50, it covers the time from creation all the way down to the death of Joseph, the son of Jacob. So it covers everything from creation, the fall, the sacrifice, the promise of a, a, a redeemer to come. It covers everything from the uh, genesis of nations and it covers everything all the way down to God calling Abraham. Then Isaac came, then Jacob came, all the patriarchs right down to Joseph, the son of Jacob just about in, and including the time when he was carried over and at the end it covers up to the death of Joseph. Joseph. Now everything from Genesis 1 to Genesis 50, 50 chapters in one book brothers and sisters covers a period of approximately 2,000 315 years. So one book with 50 chapters covers over 2,000 years. That, that is from the, pretty much from the time that Jesus died, just by, for comparison, from the time that Jesus died up to this present moment. Yes? And the book of Genesis, chapters 1 to 50, is a longer period than the time from Jesus' death to the time that we are living in right now. So it is important to understand that although we showed earlier the breakdown of the chapters and what the, the theme of each chapter is, I want us to get a sense of the duration and the scope in terms of the time in which all of these things were occurring. It was over a 2,300 and odd year period. And so we get a a good sense of the, the time and the scope in terms of the period that everything had happened in. Now, Genesis can be divided into nine major divisions. And sometimes it is good to do this so that we can isolate, we can delineate major points and major events and in so doing, we can get to understand and study um, critical areas in a very clear and concise way. And so we are seeing that Genesis, um, in terms of their chapters, can be divided properly. And there are nine major divisions in this book. And we break them down for us in terms of the vision so that we can grasp even more. And so chapters 1 to 2 in term, is division number 1, speaks about the creation. Chapter 3 overall speaks about the fall of man. Chapter 4 in terms of division speaks about the first civilization. Chapters 5 to 9 talks about Noah and his time and the flood that in that then known world had covered the world. Then chapters 10 and 11 speaks about the dispersion of nations. As we go further, we look between chapters 12 and 25 and we see where it speaks about the relationship that God had with Abraham. It talks about Abraham, how God called him, how God um, instructed him to move 
from where he was all the way to a particular place that he did not even know about, but he went in faith based on the word of God. And those many chapters speaks to the patriarch Abraham. Then chapters 17 to 35 speaks about um, Isaac. And of course, we will see that there are overlaps because Isaac was Abraham's son. So there would have to be overlaps. And so if you want to look into the life of Isaac, we will see it overlapping with Abraham, his father. Chapters 25 to 35 speaks about Jacob. But also we will see the overlaps because Jacob was Isaac's son and he was the grandson of Abraham. So indeed, there are overlaps that we will see there. And in chapters 30 to 50, speak about Joseph and equally we will see overlaps there. And it is important for us to kind of get a good sense of the breakdown of, yes, the divisions of the book. Now, chapters 1 and 2, as we said, and we're just going now into the breakdown, chapters 1 and 2 speaks about the story of creation, right? It is a record of the fact of creation and not an explanation of you know creation so it tells us in the beginning god created the heaven and earth it is stating a fact of creation and it is important to note as i just said moses simply stated in the beginning god created now let me make a point here because it is important for us to understand there are some things and this is just how god is if, if it is his will, if it is his plan, we have to accept it. It is his prerogative. He is sovereign. And he expects that humankind will accept the word that is there by faith. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. And I want us to understand this. There is a difference between God creating and God making. Things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. So that there is an aspect that is called create and there are things that God made. What is the difference? When God creates, he creates things from nothing. He just speaks and things come into being. So that we would not see a house and call it that that house was created by the contractor. A contractor cannot create a house. He makes a house. What's the difference? You create something out of nothing. Only God can do that. And you make something from things that already exist. And so we can talk about making a car or building a house or making an airplane. But they are made from metals that are already in the earth. We have to mine the soils and extract those that dirt that contained in the dirt is alumina which then goes through a process and becomes metal that makes car and airplanes and all those kind of things but the fact that it goes through the process and we get the alumina or the aluminum that makes these things we cannot say that the event inventors created the car or the plane, no, they made them because they are using material that they came and saw. But when God said, let there be, and there was, he created. He did not have any raw material. He did not use any raw material. He just spoke 
and things came into being out of nothing. And we accept and understand this by faith. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So that things which are seen, when he spoke and it came, they were not made of things which do appear. So I want us to accept what is in the book of Genesis as coming as a result of the word of God. Don't wait for the scientists to find proof and then you will accept it when the proof comes. No. Accept it on the basis that by faith or true faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So we said that chapters 1 and 2 speaks to the creation, yes, and everything that we know in creation, yes, everything that we know, it is in the book. The first day of creation, God caused and made light. The second day, God caused the air and the water. The third day, uh, God caused the land and the plants. The fourth day, God caused the lights, the heavenly bodies and all. The fifth day, the birds and the fish came on the scene. And all that we are seeing here is God just speaking things into being. Then on the sixth day, the animals came and then man. And so in six days, God created the heavens and the earth and all the things that are contained in them. And when we talk about the heavens, you know, we are talking about the heavens with which contain the first heaven and the second heaven, where the first heaven is what we look up and see in terms of the atmosphere and the stratosphere above. Then there is the heavens that we cannot see, which contains the, the planetary bodies and the galaxies with all the Milky Ways that all across encompasses and makes up the universe as we know it. And can you imagine God's just spoke and out of nowhere the Jupiter and Mars and all the planets that we know just sprung into being and then they didn't just come and stood there they came about and started their movement earth with its movement around its axis and Mars and and Jupiter and Neptune and all of them doing what they are doing, rotating around their individual axes. And what a thing that having spoken, they just came into being and they were operating. This is what you call hit the ground running. And this was creation. It had to be magnificent. It, had, it was miraculous. This was God at work in time. He was out of time. He created this space called time that you and I are a part of now. He continues in time and he's still out of time because God is eternal. So he is eternal and yet he's dwelling in time to allow for everything that he planned from Genesis to be happening until the day that he closes time and continue along that continuum called eternity. What a God! And in six days, he did everything that we know and we see and we perceive as part of his creation. And on the seventh day, the Bible said that God rested. It is important to know because, let me tell us, we are going to come in a little while. And it is going to come up in the questions that we are going to be looking at. Where questions are going to come. Did God make the dinosaurs, because scientists have 
indicated to us that the dinosaurs have been here millions of years ago and yet nowhere in the bible did it speak to dinosaurs well is that so because i believe we can show from scripture that dinosaurs were actually in the bible and how then where when we will get into it but folks come up with dinosaurs that they existed multiplied millions of years ago because of the fossils that they have now found and have carried out as i said earlier tests on them that shows that they were millions of years why is it that they cannot be wrong in terms of the technology that they are using to carbon date things it has proven to be wrong on many occasions by multiplied multiplied scores of years why can't they be wrong what if we can show that these fossils that were found were actually spoken of in the bible god spoke through job and he said some things about some giants some beasts some behemoth behemoth the bible talks about some major giant reptile that when he opens his mouth when they are in the water it is like they are drinking out the entire river we are going to show us brothers and sisters that right in the book called the bible there were some things that because we have not taken the time and many of us have been sidetracked by things that are written by the scientific minds we fail to see some things right in the bible that makes it clear that there were some gigantic animals that were on the face of the earth and were in the waters that were there right in bible times in biblical times and they tell us without the shadow of doubt that we don't have to rely on science to go back millions they say are billions of years to prove that it, it right in the book itself it speaks to some of the very things that they use to discredit the validity of the bible but i don't want to go ahead of myself we will come to them in the question and answers and we will show that they are in fact there now also i don't want us i don't want to go ahead of myself either but what we are seeing here in genesis chapters 1 and 2 that in six days god did these major things it is showing because he could have done it in one but it is showing that god is systematic he does these things orderly he does these things for a reason and without a doubt he came to day seven where he rested and seven is god's perfect number and as we go through the bible not just genesis but as we go through the entire bible even to the book of revelation we are going to see the number seven coming up very often it speaks to fullness it is god's perfect number so that god could have done everything in one day but god is very systematic and is very organized in terms of how he works with men and so he particularly chose seven because he was going to show as we will see later that this is his number it is his perfect number it is the time of fullness and we will see that god uses the number seven to bring out his fullness and his perfection right throughout the bible we know that there are seven dispensations and the last of which will be the dispensation of the millennium and in the millennium brothers and sisters it is going to be a thousand years that thousand years of rest notice now let us look the six days were six 24 hour days because when god made the earth and everything was in place it was already on its axis running that's why it could speak brothers and sisters that the morning and the evening was the first day the activities of the activities of heaven and earth was already in motion yes the the, the, the the movements of the earth around his axis was already there and so God could speak about the morning and the evening so we know that it is a 24 hour day so that when on day one light came about then when on day two air and water came about these was these were days one and two of 24 hour a 24 hour period in time so that we are seeing because god chose to do it this way that in seven days he established the heaven and the earth 
and he rested. And all of that happened in seven days. He did a particular thing in day one, a particular thing in day two, day three, day four, day five, day six, and then he rested. Now, each of these days, although they were 24-hour period, the Bible tells us later on that a thousand years is like a day. Don't take those things lightly or insignificantly. It was not just a figure of speech. Because we will show, and we will do it later, that each of the dispensation, each of the times as we know that God dealt with folks in a particular way, the seven dispensation, they represented a particular day. And as we come down the line, we are now in the dispensation of grace, which is the sixth dispensation. And we still have another that is to come, which is the dispensation of the millennium. The Bible tells us that the millennial period is going to be for a thousand years. Satan is going to be bound for a thousand years. And in that time when Satan is bound for that 30, sorry, for that 1,000 years, it is going to be during the millennial, when Jesus or the millennium, when Jesus comes and stands on the face of this earth and he's going to sit in the throne of his father David and he's going to rule this earth from Jerusalem. That 1,000 year will be the day of rest, the last day. That will be the time when Satan will be born. That will be the time when the lion and the lamb. In other words, what was lost when Adam and Eve fell and caused sin to come as a result of the temptation of Satan in the millennium, which would be the seventh dispensation, it will be the rest. So it would seem to me that God did his thing in a systematic way, that on day one he did something which probably represented the first dispensation. Then in day two he did another work which was the air and water that he created, which represented a second dispensation. All the way down till he rested the seventh day. Now look at what was happening. This earth has been around for about 6,000 years. We can trace it all the way back because the Gospels tell us and trace the genealogy of Jesus all the way back up. And it traces it all the way back to Adam. And if we do the math, it goes back 4,000 years. Right now, between the time that Jesus was here to about the time that we are here now is about 2,000 years. So you're talking about 4,000 plus 2,000, approximately 6,000 years. There will be a little period of time that might not even be counted. We are coming to that. But then there's another 1,000 years that is to come, which is the millennium. It seems to me that each 1,000 year period represents a day. And the final day, represented by God's seventh day rest, that final dispensation of a thousand years will be the rest that we have been waiting for on this earth all the way from the beginning when we lost our place in the garden of eden so it is very very important to take a peek and to look at the significance of some of these things so we thank god for what happened in these six days and what they reflect would be happening over time and that day of rest is coming when the lord is going to stand in that day upon the mount of olives and when the saints are going to come down with him and when satan is going to be bound a thousand years and we are going to have our day of rest but that being said we don't want to lose facts to lose sight of the fact that god's creation all that he did they happened in one week, including his 24-hour day of rest. There are those, even in Christendom, who would want to have us to believe that that is not so. They have presented to us, and I'm going ahead of myself, but I will stop quickly and get back to what we are presenting. But there are those that hold the view that it was not six literal days that God created the heavens and the earth. That he did a major work long before. And before Adam, there were other civilizations. 
and God destroyed them. So that if we look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. But then if we look at verse 2, it says that the earth was without form and it was void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. So that they are saying that the place was destroyed and placed into darkness and it was void. That, mean, uh, that word that says void is another word for it. That means it was waste. It laid waste. So that they are purporting that between Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 and Genesis chapter 1 verse 2 is a period of time. They call it a gap. And that's the genesis of the gap theory, where the gap theory came from. That there is a long interlude, possibly millions of years. They then say in that first scripture, Genesis 1 verse 1, is where God made all the dinosaurs were there and all of those T-Rex and those massive mammoth that we can't fathom in our mind based on how big they were. It was in those period that they were there. But God had to destroy the then known world because of how terrible things were and covered it in water and hence it was void, waste, darkness was upon the face of the deep. Because listen to what it says now, that God moved upon the face of the deep or moved upon the face of the waters. That means the place was covered in flood. Where did that flood come from? They said God covered the then known earth in waters. But the dinosaurs and all of those things were there in that period. But then in Genesis 1 and verse 2, they said a new thing happened. So in between chapter 1 verse 1 and chapter 1 verse 2 are millions of years. They call it the gap theory. And I'm just giving us an introduction to this because later on, we are going to go into it because I want us to know everything that is out there. But I also want us to know and to look from the perspective of the Bible, literally what is there. So I will go through that first. And it is important that we have it first, have the scriptures, see what it says, and then we'll look at what else is there so that we are not confused later on when other things are presented because they will be presented and especially in the era that we are in of social media, when we are seeing everything from all about to confuse folks. So we are going to take time and go through. So I just segued into that a little bit. Let me come back to what we were at and continue with our survey of uh, the book of Genesis. So we were on, let's get back on the screen so that we can, so that we can, um, continue with where we were so we said on the seventh day god rested all right now there is a <coughs> concern by many there is a concern by many that there are two creation stories if we look at genesis chapter one it speak about God. It speak about God talking and things coming into being and we see where everything came and we see things having come as a result of what he said and he just spoke and man became a living soul and everything we see it in Genesis chapter 1. But when we go back to Genesis chapter 2, we see a different thing. And how Genesis 1 puts it and how Genesis 2 puts it, in one of the chapters it said, male and female created he them. But yet in the other chapter it says, God take from the earth and formed man and then breathed into his nostril and man became a living soul. And then he caused the man to sleep and took from his side a rib and from that he made woman. And then gave her to the man. Some time had passed. And so when you look at chapter 1. And when you look at chapter 2. It seems as if they are at variance. But they are not. Both of them. Both scriptures speak to the creation. And they speak to the same story. It's just that one provide more detail. About what actually happened. One gave an overview. God made man and woman male and female created them 
it didn't go into the details that he formed man and then he blew on him and then he took out the rib. So they are both describing the same thing, save and except that one provides some more detailed information than the other, but they still come back and intersect because they are talking about the same thing. So it is not two different creation stories. One speak about the fact of creation and the other spoke to how it was done. But they intersect and it is the same thing. One creation, one God did it and we need to bear this in mind. So let's go back again to the slide uh, as we go through. All right. So it is, as I just said, it is not an account of a second creation but it's retelling of the account of rec as recorded in chapter 1, you know, with some additional details. And it, it follows a pattern that is called the law of recurrence, and it is found in different places throughout the Bible. I won't, won't even take the time to go into them now, but it, it is pretty much what happens in other areas. It's, it's, it's a basic, basic concept in Scripture. Now... Notice that God gave Adam and Eve the responsibility of dressing the garden, the privilege of partaking of all that he has done. It was perfect. It was God had some major things in mind. And it is important that we get that he wanted them to be like his representative here on earth. He was going to work. So from the very beginning, God had some things in place. But it is clear that God did not want robots neither in heaven at the time when he made the angels. Uh, he did give them, though, the opportunity to choose. Um, hence, we find that Satan was able to choose a particular path. And that's another study all by itself. And, but God is like that. He wants to know that from our own free will, we choose to worship him. And men and women can associate with that. If you're going to love somebody... Nobody wants people to love them for what they can get. It's, it's, it's one of the most um, heartbreaking things when a, a lady finds out that some, a man that she thinks she loves or she thinks loves her, is, it is only because he learns that she is wealthy. Or a man who is a wealthy man sees this lady showing so much interest in it and he falls in love with her. And it is only after they got married that he eventually found out that it was because of the fact that he was a billionaire that she really loved him. And we find stories where folks hide their wealth from the persons that they are courting because they want them to see them as normal people to see if they would in fact love them for who they are. So it is the desire, even of humankind, to have people to appreciate them for who they are and not for what they have because it's a big difference. Well, it is the same thing with God. And God placed two trees in the midst of the garden. Now, the garden had many trees, right? But he placed, he placed two. The tree of life, and, and two that is our focus. And the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, Adam and Eve could freely eat of every tree in the garden, except for the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Right? God gave a restriction. And don't be offended, brothers and sisters, when we see restrictions, when we see and hear that there are some things that we're asked not to be involved in. And, and I'm not talking about we as men saying it. I'm talking about the Bible saying things that we are to avoid and we are not to go near and we are not to let them be named among us as they commit sins. Don't take those things and believe that God is withholding from us. Sometimes restrictions are for our own benefit. And if we ever get to see what could have and would have happened to us had God not placed those restrictions in place, then we would realize that God loves us. So the restriction that he placed in the garden was for the benefit of Adam and Eve because he knew that he wanted them to exercise their ability to choose. He did not want robots. Um, 
man and woman would have been the crown of his, his creation and he did not want them to be robots, to serve him because he made them to serve him. If, if we serve God because we were simply made to serve God, it means that we would have been robots. Yes, Lord, you're a great Lord. You're worthy to be praised, Lord. That's robotic. He did not want that. How could he feel good when we didn't have the ability to choose him? So God gave us choice. And God said, choose the good. Because if we do and refuse the evil, we would be fine. The second choice was to choose to disobey. But then if we do that, we would be in problems. And so God gave Adam and Eve, having placed them in the garden, look at that beautiful place, the beautiful surroundings, the presence of God. You couldn't want it better. Somebody said some time ago, why couldn't I be Adam? Because it wouldn't happen. Or why wouldn't, couldn't I be Eve, seen in the presence of God and what we know God to be now? We wouldn't eat it. And, you know, it, it might be easy to say no. But the truth is, they had everything at their disposal. They had the presence of God. They had the garden not just with the trees and all the fruit trees and everything, but with the flowers. Just imagine a garden. So it is a, a, a combination of beauty and fruitfulness. And they would have had that at their disposal. And God then made them in a way that they would not be ro robots. They, will f they would feel that I have a choice to go over there and call this this particular name and call that that particular name. It was just perfect environment and God gave them the ability to choose and so brothers and sisters we have to understand that what we have today is the ability to choose choose wisely now as we go over into chapter 3 we see everything was good from chapters 1 and 2 we see Adam and Eve in the garden they have been given the free will agency god created us that way as i told us we can determine our destiny once we are in god based on the choices that we make it is important for us to understand that we have a certain responsibility and I don't care who we are. It is imperative that we understand. And this is coming all the way back from the book of Genesis. It is important that we understand that the choices that we make is going to determine where we end up in terms of our destiny. Now, God has something lined up for us. But we work in conjunction with God. God don't foist anything upon us. Because he made us with the ability and the capacity to choose. So that's why he said, I have set before thee good and evil. Choose good. Our choices determine where and which road we end up pursuing. And if we go a particular road, there is a destiny there. If we go the other road, there is an ultimate destiny there. And it is important that we follow the words of Almighty God and choose based on our alignment with his words so that we can get down to that end game, that destiny that God has for us. Choose well. This is what we see in Genesis chapter 3. Now the tree of knowledge of good and evil allowed man to be tested to see if he would serve God from a willing heart. That is what God desires. That was his reason for doing things the way that he did. Now some people say, why is God so wicked? God knew that we would have sinned. Of course he knew that we would, because he knows everything. But it's not that God set it that we sin. No. God wanted us to choose good. Because had we chosen... Had we chosen, had Eve not succumbed to Satan in the garden, had Adam not followed through and did what he did, and he and Eve sinned against God, 
I would not be teaching this lesson tonight. We would not be in this building tonight. You would not be at home viewing this. We probably wouldn't even have television tonight. We would have been in the garden basking in the presence of Almighty God. By now, God would have been down in his human form, dwelling with us because it was God's ultimate intention, which is going to happen in the future. That, and this is why he took on the form of man. And this is why he became man. Because ultimately, he, and, and we saw that the fullness of the God was within him. And will remain there if we look at the book of Revelation, which is the end game. There was one throne. And who sat upon the throne? The Lamb. And from his face, if you are going to see God, you are only going to see him in the face of Jesus Christ that glorified flesh and it is Jesus that sits upon the throne and yet we know based on the same revelation that God sits upon the, thr the throne so ultimately it is going to end up to what God wanted it to be from the beginning but things changed brothers and sisters because of the messing up of Adam and Eve but had that not happened and notice Adam was made in the image of God. God knew the image that he would have taken on. So God had planned from the beginning to have this image that Adam had and to dwell among us. It's just that because of sin, it, it's going to happen still because nothing can frustrate what God initially and always intends. So it is going to happen except that it is going to be future. But all that we are going through now all that you are seeing around us now, all that transpired years ago, all that will come in the future until Jesus comes, is a part of the plan as a result of the fall of man. And all of this happened for one reason, because God wanted to see, he wanted to know, it was his desire that we would serve him from a willing heart. We never had to go through all of this. God could make us that we don't sin. But he didn't want that. He wanted people desiring him. He wanted people willing to serve him. So that those who not willing ultimately will meet their end. And then he would have had a set now who is going to go into eternity with the willing hearts to serve him. And at that time, never to sin again. Cannot sin again. So that even if we are robots, then it don't matter. Because we chose him. In this period that we are here on earth, we chose him willingly. That is, it is he that we want. And so this is at the heart of what transpired in the Genesis story. God wanted people willing to serve him, to live for him, to, 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 to want him. And this is what our sojourn here on earth is all about. And that's why I want to encourage all the saints of the Most High God. Um, with all of your heart, seek him. Because this now is going to book your visa, passport, ticket and all. For the eternity that is to come where we are going to dwell with him and see him face to face so genesis chapter 3 speaks about the fall and we see here the serpent coming onto the scene yes represent and this serpent represented satan yes the author of temptation and this serpent this tempter this evil one he started it with our four parents in the garden and he continues to this very very day and we must be cognizant brothers and sisters of how satan operates it doesn't matter that it is thousands of years after the story of Genesis. It doesn't really matter. The fact is we need to know. We need to be aware. Of how he operates. 
he does not change. He does not change. And notice, he was subtle. He came in and he went to Eve. And I want us to look at what he did. Eve listened to Satan. And that was the beginning of the end for her. We must be careful of how we listen and the things that we listen to. We have to be a saints of God. You have to be very careful. We have to be very careful. If we don't, we are going to see that we end up in the same situation. We end up in the same situation that our four parents were in. Now, Eve listened to Satan's lies. And guess what happened? The first thing that happened, she started to doubt God. Then the second thing that happened, she yielded to the temptation. Having yielded inside, she went ahead now and did the thing, eat the forbidden fruit, whatever it was. I won't get into the debate now as to whether it was a apple or, you know, tangerine or if it was an actual fruit. You know, we, we, I guess probably the question and answers, we will bring up some positions that are there. And then she gave it to her husband. And it is the way that things always happen. Sin always brings judgment. They were judged. In Genesis chapter 3, we say that God passed down judgment upon all that was involved in going aside from the word of God where he said, don't eat of this particular tree. And anywhere that sin is, anywhere that we are sin abound, we are going to find that judgment is going to follow. The serpent was judged. The woman was judged. The man was judged. Even the ground was judged. And it is important that we understand that. Judgment will always come. So, brothers and sisters, we, we, are, we, we are seeing things emerging from just going through in terms of the, the division, yes, of the book. And we see that the serpent was cursed above all the animals of the earth and forced to eat the dust of the earth and to crawl upon his belly. The serpent was judged. The woman was judged and she would have had pain in child's birth. And would have been in subjection to man in the way that we see woman in subjection to man do um, today. We know what the Bible said before that the woman was made for the man, and it was that way before the flood, but in a different way than what we see today. And so that was a part of her judgment. Um, maybe she would have been having children and not having all that pain. So every time that we see a lady cry and scream, and hollow when she gives birth. Remember that screaming, not the giving of birth, but the screaming and the pain that comes with it. It's a part of what came as a result of her defying the word of God. Man was uh, judged too, and by the sweat of his brow, hard labor, being cursed with thistles which are pricks to juke him as he carried out his work. It was not intended to be so. Man was to work as a part of his creation, but it would have been a pleasurable experience as he goes about doing what he was doing. When Adam was in the garden working before the sin, it was work, but it was pleasurable. Yes, however, as soon as the curse came, work still continued, but it was now Backbreaking, hard labor, pricks sticking him, sweat, and it was just difficult just to take care of his family. It was not to be that way. And ultimately, man was expelled from the garden. And so, 
we see in the fall that God did what he had to do because he was a just God. But then, along with the judgment, along with God's judgment and justice, is God's mercy. Because shortly after that, the good God that he is, he brought hope of redemption. And he says in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, so that the seed of the woman was going to crush the head of the serpent. And thou shalt bruise his heel. But the serpent was going to cause some temporary um, harm to the Messiah that was to come, the seed that was to come. And of course, we know that that temporary harm was when he was killed on the cross. But it was temporary. It was just a bruise because he rose from the dead. But then, that the adversary, the enemy, he was going to have his own mashed in, crushed, he was going to have his head bruised. A head wound and a heel wound is two different things. And for the seed of the woman, it was going to be a heel wound, speaking of his death, but then his resurrection. But for the enemy, it was going to be a head wound and he will never recover. And that is when at the end he is going to be taken and all the demonic forces the angels of darkness with him and everyone that hate God and they are going to be confined to hell and to chains and everlasting torment and there will be no recovery there will be no resurrection there will be no more life after that and so this scripture speaks to the hope that is to come so that those who desire God will have an avenue in which to access him. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15 is the first promise of the Messiah that was to come. And a lot of other scriptures spoke, speak about it. Isaiah 7 and verse 14, many of us know. But if we look to Matthew chapter 1 and verse 21, it speaks about it. Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4, it speaks about it. Just make note of these scriptures, saints of God. Look at them and we will see that, they're, that all that we are looking at in our scriptures in the New Testament and in the Old Testament after Genesis, as is the case with Isaiah 7 and verse 14, they all came about as a result of that first promise that a seed was coming of the woman. Now, the seed is always of the man, as we know. It is the man that plants the seed into the fertile womb of the woman. So it is unheard of to talk about the seed of a woman. It is always the seed of a man. But God knows what he is doing. If it was the seed of a man and sin was already in the world and because of Adam, sin was passed on to all men, then if the Messiah was to come via the seed of a man, he would have been contaminated before he came to this earth. But thank God, God changed the order. And not, I'm telling us, the devil cannot have victory. God knows everything from the beginning to the end. So God changed the order of thing, weird things. Whereas we speak about the seed of a man, the Messiah's father would not have been a man. It was not Joseph. And so it couldn't have been the seed of Joseph. He would have been tainted with sin. So God said it was the seed of a woman. How can that be? How can a woman cause herself to be carrying a child and she was not uh, impregnated by the seed of a man? But God said, no, no, no. That would have caused Adam's sin to be transferred to the Messiah that was to come. And he therefore could not carry out the promise. So God in Genesis talks about the seed of a woman confused the enemy. And when the time came, the Holy Ghost overshadowed her and caused that holy thing to be planted 
in her womb. So now that that holy seed was there, no contamination from Adam's race. It was only planted there, holy, spotless, in the womb. And so it can be considered the seed of the woman, but ultimately the father was none other than Almighty God. What a thing was conceived in Genesis, the book of beginnings. And look here, it ties up with everything that happened in the book of St. Matthew. Brethren, whether it is Genesis, it is Matthew, or it is Revelation, there is one seamless tapestry of information, of activities that is in the Bible, and they all add up and come to one particular place, and that is to fulfill the will of Almighty God. We can see now that Genesis is not just a book by ourselves giving us a story. It is a book that is there and it is outlining its purpose so that we can put the pieces together and see that the God who oversees all things takes something from Genesis, show you how it happened, show you the fall, and then show you how he's picking up the pieces in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He shows you before that some things that he will do in order that the pieces can come together. And he gave us some types, amen, in the book of Exodus and other books coming down and show the system of offering of sacrifices and was giving us a typology of the ultimate sacrifice that was to come in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. My God, and it all had its origin in Genesis. Genesis gave us the details of everything as it started, how the fall came, why the fall came, and showed us from chapter 3 of the fall that he put something in place so that we can rise from the fall. And so as we go through every other book, we are now able, brothers and sisters, to put the pieces together. This is absolutely awesome. This is God at work in his beauty, in his power, and in his oneness of purpose. And as we look through Genesis, and later on related to what happens in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and later on in the end of the book when all things will be restored, which is ultimately where it should have been from the beginning, we are going to see that although there are 66 books, it is really one story. Why Genesis? What is the purpose? To show that it is the beginning and it is the part of a sequence of events that would have been happening to take us through a complete cycle. We cannot appreciate a cycle if we don't see the beginning of the process and the end of the process. And so the purpose of Genesis is to show us the beginning of the cycle, the beginning of the process, so that we can see the hand of God through Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy and all the books going down, and then the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and all the books going down, and then Revelation, which closes it off and bring the whole thing back to the original as it was in the beginning it is going to be in the end what is that that there is going to be a restoration of the garden of eden and it is going to be at the time of the millennium when there are there will be no more wars where there will be no more satan because he would have been bound for a thousand years where the lamb and the lion will lay together where they will not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain where the lion will eat grass and straw like the lamb my god this sounds like a paradise and that is exactly what it's going to be but for us to appreciate what's going to be happening in the end we had to see it at the beginning and Genesis' purpose is to show us the beginning so that we can appreciate what is happening in the middle and what will happen at the end and put the entire pieces together and see how this puzzle works. Brothers and sisters, the book is one book 
and it is important that we take it from bottom or from top to bottom and see how the whole thing fits and that is extremely extremely important now chapter four um chapter four gives us the first civilization and we are into the third division right so i'm happy that we are following that we remember now we started out talking about the divisions and we said that there were how many nine divisions in the book of genesis is divided into nine major divisions the first division was creation and chapters one and two uh gave us a full portrayal of that yes the second division was the fall and chapter three gives us a full portrayal of that and we have been going through that now the third division is the first civilization and the chapter four gives us a breakdown of this third division the first civiliz civilization so as adam and as time progressed adam and Eve had two sons and we know them cain and abel and you know life is like that no two children are exactly the same right no two children um do things exactly the same way there is a difference even though they have the same parents even though the parents would have instilled in them the same uh responsibility sense of responsibility sense of character that they want to develop in them but because god has given us the ability to choose we can choose to do things the way that we want to do things it is our choice or we can choose to do things the way that god wants us to do things based on the things that have been instilled in our hearts that have been taught to us the character traits that you know have been impressed in our minds we take them in and then we choose to be who god wants us to be now we can take on different careers we can do different things that's fine but then when it comes to serving god and in choosing our career we make that choice in doing the things that we want to do brothers and sisters we make that choice but when it comes to serving god we don't choose how we serve god we serve god the way that god wants us to serve him and it is important that we understand that if we choose to serve god the way that we feel like we are going to have a problem yes so we have things that we can do for ourselves we have things that we must do for ourselves because we have been given the ability to choose but we have been asked to choose wisely now cain and abel their parents taught them about God. They, no doubt they told them about the, the fall. They, no doubt they told them about what they had to encounter. No doubt they told them that they ran and they hid themselves. No doubt they told them that they ran and they hid themselves. Um, because their eyes were opened. And they, they therefore saw each other's nakedness and it, it affected them. Yet no doubt they, they were told all of that. No doubt the, the kids learned that God had to uh, kill an animal and use the skin of that animal to provide covering for Adam and Eve. No doubt the parents would have given them the history so that both children would have had the common teaching the common history clearly clearly they knew what was required of them they knew and we're going to show you from scripture that they knew what was required of them when they went to god so we see here now that the children are going to make an offering to god how did they know that they must make an offering their parents had to tell them they taught them it is time to make an offering to god so from from childhood 
children must be taught, must learn. And they learn this from their parents. This is family life. Yes, this is civilization. I mean, we never get into the family life part of it. Because, like I said, there's so much. But this is Adam and Eve instilling discipline in their children. This is Adam and Eve teaching them that they must serve the Lord. This is Adam and Eve teaching them how to serve the Lord. God is not wicked. God is not partial. There is no way that God would have these young men. They don't know what to do. One offered a particular sacrifice. The other one offered something else. And God chose one and reject the other. And they didn't know what to do. God is not like that. God is just. And God is an equitable God. And you can write that down. I'm just telling us how God is. He's just. He's kind. He's good. He's, he, he, he stands for equity and justice for all. If you didn't know, and he knows that you don't know, remember now, they had nobody else to tell them but their parents. And if the parents didn't tell them, and God didn't tell them, how would they know? So for them to know that they had to offer a sacrifice first of all, they had to be told. For them to know what kind of sacrifice to be offered they had to be told bible simple now let us look at let us bring up back, let us bring the, the the slide back up and let us look at some things with adam with cain sorry and abel different careers but notice that cain and abel made their sacrifices Different way of life. But notice that Cain and Abel made their sacrifices. Different approaches to life. But notice that they made their sacrifices. They knew. Let us look at what we have here on the slide. Cain was a tiller of the ground. Wonderful. Nothing is wrong with that. Abel was a keeper of flocks. Nothing wrong with that. But we are seeing something now. Cain, he had his heart bent towards the things of the world. Something is wrong with that. But on the other hand, Cain, Abel, had a heart that was inclined to God now when the heart is inclined to God brothers and sisters it causes us when it is time to give to God when it is time to serve God it causes us to do it on his terms if our heart is bent away from God however we want to define and put that it causes us to want to still give to him you know because we know Cain and Abel had their parents no doubt teaching them that it is required that you give to God. But Cain's heart was bent away from God. But he still knew that he had to give. But guess what? He gave on his terms. He gave what he felt he could give and should give based on what he had. On the other hand, Abel, whose heart was inclined to God, gave God on God's terms. And that is crucial. Cain offered a sacrifice that was not acceptable to God. And Abel offered a sacrifice that God received. And this is significant. It is saying to us, brothers and sisters, right in Genesis at the start, at the dawn of the first civilization, it is important that we understand that, yes, we are all children of Adam, as Cain and Abel were, and therefore we are all called upon to serve as both of them did. But guess what? One served on his terms, and the other served on God's terms and that 
is important. It makes the difference. And the difference led to some serious, serious conflict. The Bible said that not as Cain, who was of that wicked one and slew his brother. And why did he slay him? Because his own works were evil and his brother's works were good or righteous. Now, that is very, very, very significant. That is very important. Did you know, brothers and sisters, what it was that Cain offered? He offered, as we saw in the slide, what came from the ground. He offered that. Nothing is wrong with the produce from the ground. Because that is what all of us would eat. It is what the animals that Abel used to offer the sacrifice to God had to eat also to stay alive. So nothing is wrong with banana or yam or dasheen or, what, or carrot or whatever that the earth yielded. Doesn't matter that the ground was cursed. Even the animals that would have been used to offer the sacrifice had to eat from what the earth yielded. Nothing either is wrong with and by itself with the animal that Abel offered. As I said, those animals themselves in order to stay alive had to eat the grass that came from the cursed earth. The shrubs that came from the cursed earth. It doesn't matter. So by themselves produced from the earth or the animal by themselves they would have been fine. The thing is we are seeing is that God required a particular sacrifice that must have blood. And it didn't matter. It could be that Cain didn't want to go ask Abel for any of it because of pride. I don't need what you have. I have my own thing. I'm going to give this to God. Even though he knew what was required and that a blood sacrifice was required. Remember, we said they had to know God is just either Adam and Eve or God himself. But no doubt, easily we can extrapolate and know that the parents told them. Why do you say that, Brother Daly? Suppose they didn't know. The Bible says, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Earlier on we quoted the scripture, by faith Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, his brother. By faith. Notice now, how does faith come? By hearing. And how hearing come? By the word of God. God's word was there for them. Whether directly from God or through Adam and Eve, the word came to them. And they heard it. Hence their faith was made alive. And Abel, through faith, which came from what he heard, offered blood sacrifice. Cain would have heard the same thing, but there was no faith because he then moved on to do what he chose in spite of what the word required. And it is significant that we see the lesson emerging from Cain and Abel that God accepted one and rejected the other although they both heard the word of God and although they both had 
the capacity to develop faith. It was Abel that used the faith based on the things that he heard and offered a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Cain did it on his terms and it was rejected. And so we have pretty much a lesson emerging from that. And it is very important, brothers and sisters. And so, just look back at the screen as we gear up to go down to the final um, part for today. And I think we are on the other screen because we see now where Cain murdered his brother as a result of jealousy. Yes, as a result of God accepting the sacrifice of Abel and rejecting the sacrifice of Cain. Jealousy rose in his heart and he murdered his brother. And Genesis 4 and verse 16 said that Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden so that he now left from where God was centralized in that garden area and he left the presence of the Lord, he left the garden and he went in the land of Nod and he dwelt there. And it was in this land that Cain built a city and began the first man-made civilization characterized by agriculture and all the things, you know, that make up basic city life. And brothers and sisters, the first civilization, the first city, the first semblance of uh, city life was right here in Nod by Cain. And a whole lot of things were happening. Notice the city was marked by violence because he left the presence of God. And when we are away from the presence of God, there can be no peace. There can be no peace. And that is very important. And so we learn again, lesson to us in this first civilization. It doesn't matter if you leave and you set up nice things around you and there is order in a city and there are manufacturing um, facilities and agricultural facilities. It just does not matter. If you leave the presence of God, whatever nice it is that you go into, whatever it is that you are going to pursue, there will always be a particular spirit traveling with you because there can be no peace when a person leaves the presence of God. And we end chapter 4 which is the end of Division 3 about the first civilization with the birth of Seth, yes, and the promise that redemption would come through him. I close with Genesis chapter 4, verses 25 and 26. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son and called his name Seth. For God, said she, hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew, and to Seth, to him also there was born a son, and he called his name Enos. Then began, me, began men to call upon the name of the Lord. Brothers and sisters, we close here. We close here because when we get back together, we will look at the fourth division, remember there were nine of them. We look at the fourth one, which is the flood. And it runs from chapters 5 to 9. And we then go through and try to wrap up the other five. So that we can have a good sense of the entire book. The entire divisional breakdown. Cover all the chapters. And then we start to extract some lessons more and more as we go on what the of the three objectives that we gave at the start one which is to build our faith as we go through the book of genesis two which to 
which is to answer the many questions that will come so that we have a good sense that the Bible is clear on these things. And third, that we understand the purpose of Genesis, why it was written. We, 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 we looked at the last objective earlier on to see the purpose. And what was the purpose? That we can see the sequence of things, how it started, why is it that we are going through the things that we are going through? Why is it that we are where we are today? Why is it that Jesus had to come? Why is it that the church is here and we are going through what is in the church today? Why is it that there is going to be a rapture? Why is it that there is a millennium to come that is going to be a, we are going to have a new day, a golden age, a garden experience where the animals are? Why? Because Genesis was able to give us a perspective that it started in the garden the fall of man caused God to expel them and then to change the order of things but with the judgment and the expulsion there was a promise that someone was going to come it is all in the book of Genesis so that when we see Genesis we can start to understand why Jesus the Messiah came because Genesis said it in chapter 3 and verse 15. So that we see that Genesis is a part of the puzzle. And so is all the other, so are all the other books that are there and all the way down to Revelation. And piece by piece, we will see the puzzle coming together. We would not have been able to see the puzzle if we did not appreciate Genesis. What happened? What went wrong? And how it was set to come back together to come to the glorious end that we are seeing in Revelation when the millennium will come. So the purpose of the book we are clear on now and we have yet to look at building our faith and then answering the questions so that we will be clear on the entire objectives, the three objectives that we set out for the book. We stop here and God's willing next week, same time, we pick up as we go through the book of Genesis and extract from it what is in there for all of us. God bless you. Can we pray? Father, we give you thanks. We bless your name. We thank you for another opportunity to sit in Bible study, to share from the word of God. Thank you for the book of Genesis that we are in. Thank you for the things that you are bringing to illuminate our minds. I pray, God, that you will touch our minds and you will touch our hearts and have us to readily grasp and readily receive the things that are contained in your words. Build us accordingly. Build our faith. Evermore increase our faith. Let your name be glorified. Have your own way. Remember to bless your children. Bless every one of those that call upon your name. The unsaved that are joined with us in Bible study. Touch their minds and their hearts. And have them to come to a saving knowledge of who you are. Let your perfect will be done. We give you thanks. We glorify you mighty God. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen and amen. Praise God. God richly bless you. Thanks again. And as we said, God's willing, next week we pick, up, we pick up on division number four and we continue on in the book of Genesis. God bless you in Jesus' name.